I guess we should start. I see no reason not to. It's 16 past, we're already late. So as it says on the screen, I've updated the lecture notes. They're on my website as usual. I don't want to spam you all with emails every time I update the notes. I tend to update them about once a week, usually on Fridays, just that's how things go. But this update has a new chapter. So this is a proper new update. We're at version 0.6 of the notes. So we're not gonna have the problem of running out of lecture material. And I was a bit scared of that happening. I got my act together and wrote a chapter. Also about this yearbook thing that I emailed everybody about, and hopefully you all got that email. If you want to be in that, don't forget to email me. I'm probably gonna finalize it next week. So you've got time. And um, yeah, what else do I wanna say about that yearbook? Feel free to not include any information you want to not include. Photos, for example, you don't have to do that. I am putting the photo next to the information you send me in the yearbook so that all these things are not fully public, but at least shared among the students. And I think I've had 10 people email me so far, which is nice. And some people have apologized for being late, but you're still early. <laughs> don't worry about it. So let's do some lecturing. Lecture seven, time has flown. So let's just recall what we ended on last week, because as always, we forget. So if I remember correctly, the last thing we talked about was the Martingale convergence property of a Barnack space. We just made a definition. So for P between one and infinity, including endpoints, we say that a Barnack space X has the Martingale convergence property or the P Martingale convergence property. Which we'll abbreviate as PMCP and which I will point out once more is not standard notation, but we're gonna use it anyway. X has this property. If every LP bounded Martingale valued in X converges almost everywhere to some limit. And also when P equals one, we have to also make the assumption that the Martingale is uniformly integrable. So the uniformly integrable if P equals one. And I won't write down the definitions of LP bounded and uniformly integrable here um, because I assume everybody remembers them perfectly. Of course you don't, we'll see them when they come up. You'll remember when you see them. Uniform integrability in particular has a kind of funny definition that's easy to forget. We'll get to that. Basically when P equals one, you need a somewhat stronger condition than pure uniform integrity, uh, than pure L1 boundedness because you want to guarantee some sort of weak compactness of bounded sets and uniform integrability gives you that. You don't have weak compactness of a general bounded set in L1. L1 is not reflexive. That's a bit of an obstruction. Yeah. So that was our definition that we made. You should also recall that the P Martingale convergence property implies the Q Martingale convergence property if P is less than or equal to Q. Did we prove this last week? I think we did. This is sort of trivial. If P is greater than one, if P is equal to one, you just need to show uniform integrability of a bounded set in LQ using Helder's inequality. Yeah, we did that, I remember that. And I'm seeing nods, so we must have done it. The other thing to remember is that finite dimensional spaces have, or has, let's conjugate this verb properly, finite dimensional X has the one Martingale convergence property, the strongest one, because the scalar field has it. We showed that scalar Martingales are well behaved and everything that's true for the scalar field is pretty much also true for finite dimensional spaces. That's not a problem. It's infinite dimensions that we need to really think about. Okay, that's the end of our recollection. Does anybody have any quick questions about that before we move on to, to new stuff? All good, okay. 
Sorry, I, I wasn't there last time. So uniformly yeah. integrable is, is different from uh, L1? Um, yeah, so, okay, I guess I better give the definition then. So a subset F of the scalar L1 space, L1, is uniformly integrable. If uh, for all epsilon, there exists delta, both of these are greater than zero, such that uh, probability of A less than delta implies that the supremum of functions in F integrals over the set A of F is less than epsilon. Is this the right definition? I'm doing this off the top of my head. I hope it's right. Got nods. But yes. it looks like what you would want, yeah, to avoid, uh, yeah, right. You want to avoid running into measures rather than L1 function, something like that. Yeah, essentially, yeah. That's that's one way to think of it, because you could think of L1 not being reflexive. The problem is that the double dual of L1 is a space of measures. And if you want to do these arguments without the reflexivity, without the extra assumption of uniform integrability, you'll you'll start hitting measures. Okay, okay, good. Uh, good thanks, for, it, yeah. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. I'm sure you said yeah. it last time. Yeah, okay. Well, I didn't say the thing about measures last time because I didn't think of it that way. Uh, I'm not sure. It's 100%. Yeah. Uh, it's a good point. It's actually it correct. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. It feels a lot like it. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah and as part, of a, as part of this result here, that the P property implies a Q property, you can show that if you have a subset of LQ with Q greater than one, which is bounded, that will be uniformly integrable. You can use Helder's inequality to prove that. But it's not true for a general bounded subset of L1. Yeah. Good, that's a good little diversion. We should, yeah, spend more time thinking about that. It's not a problem. So I'll move on. Let's talk about some non-examples. I like to talk about examples and I like to talk about non-examples even more, perhaps. Spaces without the Van Gaal convergence property, just to show that it's a, a non-trivial property. Space C0 and the space L1 over certain measure spaces, not all, don't have any Martin Gale convergence property. So I'll just say it doesn't have MCP. I mean, it doesn't have P MCP for anything. We'll prove this. These are these are known to be classically bad Barnard spaces, so it's not really a surprise that they don't have this property. Let's take our probability space omega to be the one that we usually take. Sequences of plus minus ones with the product measure and so on, product sigma algebra. And let's take pi n as always to be coordinate functions. Just as we were doing with this gambling with vectors game that we were doing repeatedly. So first let's take our Barnack space to be C zero. And I forget whether I've defined C zero in this class before, I probably have or haven't, I don't know, I'll define it again anyway. It's the set of scalar valued sequences such that as n goes to infinity, a n goes to zero. So these sequences are automatically bounded because if you have a sequence and it goes to infinity, okay, it has to be bounded. It's contained in small l infinity and we use the l infinity norm on this Barnack space. So C0 is a closed subspace of L infinity. So it's a Barnack space in its own right with that norm. And this is the, the classic example of a poorly behaved Barnack space. And whenever you want to disprove a property, you disprove it for C0 and that's already telling you something. Consider the sequence of standard basis elements. It's a base, well, these are called a lot of different things standard basis, standard basis elements, whatever. So the standard basis of C0. So EN is the sequence with a bunch of zeros and then a one 
and then zeros all the way to the end. So this one is in the nth position. I'm sure I've defined this before. I'm sure you've seen it before. Maybe you haven't. Now let's define a martingale. We define a C0 valued martingale uh, on omega with respect to the filtration generated by the coordinate functions. So with respect to the coordinate filtration that I've defined before. And this martingale, we've seen it before. We'll call it martingale F bullet. So Fn is the sum k from zero to n of the coordinate function tensor with the basis element Ek. And unpacking that notation a little bit, Fn is a, a sequence valued function. So we can think of it as a sequence of functions if we like. And in that notation, it's the sequence pi zero, pi one, up to pi n, and then a bunch of zeros. So Fn of omega is given by this vector, pi zero omega, pi one omega, and so on. And we've seen in various propositions and examples and whatever that Fn is actually a martingale. It's, it's a martingale transform of the, the sum process given by the, the coordinate functions pi with coefficients given by the vectors ek. This is actually a special case of our gambling situation where you bet the vector ek at the kth time, no matter what's happened in the previous steps. And this will be what you have at time n. So this is a martingale. It is an L infinity bounded martingale because when you check the norm of Fn in L infinity, valid in C0, of course, this by definition is the essential supremum over omega in the probability space of the vector pi zero omega, pi one omega, etc. in the C0 norm, which is the L infinity norm, just restricted to sequences that have limit zero at infinity. And all of these values are plus or minus one. They're not all the same value, but they're independent signs. And the, the supremum, well, the L infinity norm of that vector is one because the largest coefficient is one. And that norm is independent of omega. It's one all the time. So the norm here is one. This tells you that F bullet is L infinity bounded. The supremum over N of the L infinity norm of Fn is finite. It's one, that's quite finite. Now we want to show that this martingale doesn't have a limit, doesn't converge almost everywhere because that would disprove that C zero has the infinity martingale convergence property. And this is not too hard to see if you take an element of the probability space and you take n less than m, you can look at the difference between fn of omega and fm of omega. You can look at the, the difference between these two values of the martingale. And you can look at how big this difference is. Now this is a vector, it's got a bunch of zeros. Then you have pi n plus one omega pi n plus two omega and so on up to pi m because n is less than m the way we've set things up then a bunch of zeros. So you take the L infinity norm of that and as before that norm is one. You have a non-zero number of entries here because n is less than m. They've all got absolute value one so this norm is one. So whenever you have fn and fm added omega in the probability space, they're at least one apart. And this is a serious obstruction to convergence <laughs> of that sequence. Because what this tells you is that the sequence Fn omega over all n is definitely not Cauchy in C0. So it's not convergent. If it were Cauchy, then this Fn minus Fn, this would have to go to zero. 
as n and m go to infinity independently, but that's not true. So what this tells you is that f bullet, this martingale, has no pointwise limit anywhere. So it certainly doesn't converge almost everywhere. <laughs> it's actually quite a bit worse than that. And this tells you that the Banach space C0 does not have the infinity martingale convergence property. It also tells you that it doesn't have the one martingale convergence property because that would imply the infinity martingale convergence property. It's a stronger property, right? Can't have a stronger property if it fails the weaker one. Did you use anywhere that you are C0 and not L infinity? Also implies that L infinity doesn't have it. Okay. <laughs> Just that was actually going to be the next thing I'd say. The, the proof is stronger when you prove it for C0, right? Because okay. you could know a priori yeah. that L infinity didn't have this property, but C0 is smaller. Okay. Maybe it still okay. does have the property, yeah. but the yeah. smaller space doesn't have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, usually when you disprove a property for L infinity, you can actually, the proof usually works for C0 as well. That's pretty typical. Like the, the prototypical bad Barnack space, you often think of it as being L infinity, but C0 is actually the bad one. That's the, the one that's really causing all the trouble. I should get some wireless headphones so that they stop falling out whenever I move. <laughs> all right, uh, I was going to show L1 as well. So now let's let X be L1 with the same omega as before. We're still in the same context, same notation. We're going to use the same coordinate functions and so on to construct this counter example. This one's a bit harder though, not quite as simple as just taking a sum of basis elements. We have to work a little bit more here. We're going to define a martingale called G and G N of omega we're still going to construct martingales on omega valued in x. And x is L1 of omega. And this already gets a little bit confusing because omega is playing two separate roles. So I'm going to call the Barnack space x from now on. And you should keep in the back of your mind, but sort of forget that x is L1 of omega. x is now a Barnack space. So gn of omega is going to be a product. So already things are a little bit different k less than n of this thing here, one plus pi k of omega times the vector pi k. <laughs> pi k is in x because x is a space of functions on omega. This, yeah. Pi k is playing two separate roles here. <laughs> It's the same pi k, but it's playing two separate roles, if that makes sense. I'll admit up front, I don't fully understand what's going on with this example. I can follow it formally, <laughs> but I don't fully get it. Maybe somebody who knows probability better than me can explain what's going on here. Now, there's an exercise in the notes, exercise 3.12, to show that G is a martingale. because you have to work a little bit, not too much, but you do need to put in a couple of lines of work that I don't want to do live, but it is a martingale. Now, what do we want to show? We want to show that it's L infinity bounded and that it doesn't have limits almost everywhere. So let's show the L infinity bound first. So for omega in this probability space, omega for natural number N, Let's compute the norm in X. And we're going to get a uniform bound here over all omega and N. So by definition, this is because it's X is L1. This is the integral of an absolute value of this thing. One plus pi K omega pi K. And we need another variable. Let's call it eta. And we're integrating with respect to eta here. 
And first thing to notice is that this is one plus something, and this something is going to be either plus or minus one. So this is not negative. It's either going to be zero or two. So we can drop the absolute value. That doesn't do anything. Now we're also going to use that these things that are being multiplied, these factors here, these are independent, pairwise independent, or mutually independent, I should say. They're independent as functions of eta because these coordinate functions are independent. And so the integral of a product of independent random variables is the product of the integral, which everybody remembers from the hypothetical probability class they all took. Let's put a bracket to make things a bit clearer. So now we have a product of integrals and this integrand here is, its value is two half the time and zero half the time because it's one plus you've got this pi k eta which is either plus or minus one half the time and you're just multiplying it by pi k of omega which is either plus or minus one and it doesn't change what the integral is in the end so this this integral is equal to one and you're taking a product of ones so that's one <coughs> So the martingale G is L infinity bounded. Does that derivation here make sense? It's just independence. If you're not used to independence, think of it as being sort of like, well, it's like orthogonality, but the main property is that integrals of products of independent things are products of the integrals. You know, they don't really interact with each other. Right, so, yep. Sorry, what do you mean by L infinity? X is L1 here, right? Or... X is L1 and G, <laughs> yeah, this is a bit confusing. What we're evaluating is the L infinity norm over omega valued in X. Ah, ah, okay, okay. And this is why I wanted to say like, forget what X is as far as possible. X is a Barnack space. We're looking at L infinity valued in X. And then later on when we're computing, we can say, well, X is L1. <laughs> Okay, yeah. So it's an L infinity. So we're doing this for each omega here. So then when we take the supremum over omega, we get the L infinity norm. Yeah. But okay. the result here is independent of omega. So just to emphasize that. Yeah, it can get confusing when you're looking at Barnack valued stuff and you're looking at LP valued in X and X is itself an LQ space. And then you're thinking of, you know, mixed norms or whatever. And I prefer not to think of them as mixed norms. It's just Barnack valued. It's just Bachner spaces. At least for me, that's easier. I don't know about everybody else. So what do we need to show now? This we've, this Martin goes L infinity bounded. We need to show it doesn't have pointwise limits, and we get, it's not going to have any pointwise limits anywhere. Just like the previous example, it's going to be extremely bad. Not extremely bad. Extremely bad. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, for all n less than m, we're going to show that the sequence is not Cauchy, just like before. Should quantify everything for all omega. And here we're not, uh, we don't need an n. <laughs> we're just comparing gn with gn plus one. And we're going to show that this norm here is one, and that already prevents the sequence from being Cauchy. We don't need an arbitrary m greater than n here. It's easier to not have it. So the norms in X, of course, that's an L1 norm. We, you know, we forget that as much as possible until we have to make a computation. And I'll write out what this is in a slightly simplified form, which will make sense once you see the whole thing. Be careful with my brackets. Absolute value goes there, integrating in a variable eta. Uh, this is because if you take the first term here, you multiply it out, this is gn. And you take the second term here, multiply it with that product, you get gn plus one. 
you subtract the two, take out some, take out the common factor of the product up to n. All right. Now this part here is non-negative as in the previous computation. So it doesn't affect the, the absolute value here. So we take that absolute value out. We write this as you've got a one minus one. That's zero last time I checked. And we are left with this term here with an absolute value. And that's important because this term can be positive or negative. And then we have the product that's left over, which is automatically non-negative. And so it doesn't need a, a modulus or an absolute value. There. So this factor on the left involves pi n plus one. And this, well, my screen is not happy today. This factor on the right only involves pi k for k up to n. So we have independence. So we have independent factors. And so the integral of this product is the product of the integrals. So we get the integral on the left. d eta times the integral of this thing. And we computed before that that was one. So let's just say times one. Haven't made any mistakes there, nope. And now this absolute value here, this has got absolute value one because it's a product of plus or minus ones and we're integrating it over a probability space. So we get a one in the end. So this difference here is always one and that stops the sequence from being Cauchy. So, Gn of omega is not Cauchy in X. Of course, X is L1, but we don't want to think about that. Therefore, not convergent. And this is for omega. And that tells you that L1 of this particular omega, this particular omega, not all omega, L1 of this omega does not have the infinity Martin Gale convergence property. It's infinity because we did everything in L infinity. But remember, this is the weakest of the properties. So it doesn't have the L1 Martin Gale convergence property either. It doesn't have any LP Martin Gale convergence property. Okay, all of these properties are equivalent, but we don't know that yet. Right? Okay. And just one little note, an important one, something that I'd gloss over most of the time with these Barnack space properties is that the, the P Martin Gale convergence property for a given P is stable under isomorphism. If you're used to Barnack spaces, this is obvious. If you're not, maybe it's a slight surprise, maybe not. If you have X and it's got a Martin Gale convergence property and you've got Y and you have an isomorphism between Y and X, then you can pull all the properties of X over to Y. You'll get some changes in constants in quantitative things, but if something is true up to a constant, it's going to be true up to a potentially different constant for an isomorphic Barnack space. So Martin Gale convergence in particular, being a qualitative property is completely stable under isomorphism. So this L1 for this particular omega doesn't have the Martin Gale convergence property or the infinity of any Martin Gale convergence properties. I will state without proof that L1 of omega for this particular omega is isomorphic to L1 of a measure space nu for all nu such that, well, I've written it down here, what, for all nu that are sigma finite and non-atomic. So as long as there are no atoms in the measure space, as long as it's sigma finite, you have an isomorphism between this L1 space and the L1 space we are working with up here. So none of these L1 spaces have the Martin Gale convergence property. For example, L1 of R, L1 of RD, L1 of the unit interval, whatever. All of these fail the Martin Gale convergence property, but not little L1, which is L1 of N with the counting measure. 
because that measure space is atomic. So you don't have the isomorphism with this particular L1 space that we were talking about. And we will show later on that little L1 actually does have the Martingale convergence property. <laughs> we haven't shown that yet, but yeah, it's not within the scope of this theorem because atomic measures behave a little bit differently. Okay. So I have a result I can prove before the break. I think we have time for this. I hope we have time for this. We move the break later if we need to. This is a, a stapled over or I've written theorem. Here's a theorem or proposition. It's a theorem. Okay. Let's prove something general. If nobody's got any questions about the, the non-examples from before. Seems not good. Let's prove a positive abstract result. If X is a separable dual space, so X is Y dual for some Y and X is separable, then X has the infinity Martin-Gell convergence property, the weakest one, not the strongest one. Uh, they're equivalent anyway, but yeah. So here's where you see that little l1 has this property because little l1 is separable and it's the dual of everybody's favorite bad Banach space, C0. <laughs> if you don't know about this duality, um, it's the same proof as the LP, LP prime duality. And you use the fact that simple functions actually behave nicely in C0 and they don't behave so nicely in L infinity. Or you take the, the proof that the dual of L infinity is the finitely additive measures. And because you don't have all of L infinity, you don't get the strictly finitely additive measures anymore. You just get the countably additive ones and then you use rad on Nicodem to show that it's little L1. Okay. I realize now I'm rambling a bit about L1. Separable dual spaces. They appear quite a lot in functional analysis. It's a nice class of spaces to work with. You can prove a lot of general theorems for them using both separability and the weak star topology that comes from being a dual space. That's what we're gonna do here. Okay, let's start. So what do we wanna show? We wanna show that every X valued L infinity bounded Martingale converges almost everywhere. So let's let F be an X valued L infinity bounded Martingale on some probability space which doesn't matter. And just by rescaling, we can assume that the, the bound on F, this L infinity bound is one, although we don't really have to do this, right? We are just like working with the unit ball. So what do we start with? We start by the banach alauku theorem. which I think I've mentioned before, which says that the unit ball of X, the closed unit ball of X, I don't think I've used this notation yet. The closed unit ball of X is weak star compact. Of course, this weak star topology comes from the fact that X is the dual of Y. So this topology comes from testing against vectors in Y. That's what the weak star topology is, and it's got miraculous compactness properties. So using that compactness for every omega, we define a function f, f of omega. Okay, that was stated badly. We define a function f for every omega. f of omega is defined to be a weak star limit point. of the sequence Fn omega. And a priori, there are more than one of these. We just choose one arbitrarily. We don't get any measurability for free. We're gonna to have to prove all of these properties. 
but we can at least choose a weak star limit point for every omega. Maybe I should be saying almost every omega because everything's only defined almost everywhere. Pick a representative of the equivalence class and work with that. Everything will be fine. Now, what do I want to show? We're going to need to show that F is strongly measurable and that Fn converges to F. And then Fn has an almost everywhere limit. Now, since X is separable, there's a theorem that says that if your Barnack space is a dual is separable, then the space itself is separable. So since X is the dual of Y and X is separable, Y is separable, which is good. And we choose countable dense subset of Y, we call it D, D for dense. Well, not of Y, sorry, we don't want to choose it in Y, we want to choose it in the, the closed unit ball of Y. Since Y is separable, it's closed unit ball is also separable. Now for all vectors Y in that dense subspace, we can consider the pairing of Y against Fn. This is a scalar valued function on omega because Fn is a Y star valued function. We consider the sequence of functions. And this is a scalar valued L infinity bounded martingale. The martingale property is just, it's a linearity thing. It's preserved by take, by pairing against functionals, conditional expectations, behaviors they should, and so on. And it's scalar valued. And because the scalar field has the martingale convergence property, this converges almost everywhere to something. And this limit or the limit must be y paired against the function f that we defined before three weak star limit points. You can check that. It's not too hard to show. Because we defined f as weak star limit points and we're pairing against things in the pre-dual space y, this, this is all compatible here. So it converges almost everywhere. It converges to this, it has to, away from a null set away from a set of measure zero, because we only get the convergence guaranteed almost everywhere. So for all n, scroll up a little bit, for all n, for all vectors y in that dense subset, let's let n sub y, my y is a bit too fancy there, let's make a less fancy y, n sub y will be the set on which the convergence of this martingale to this function fails. The, the measure zero is set where everything goes wrong. And we've done this argument before, I think when we were doing Petter type arguments way back in week one or two, let's let N be the union of all of these null sets over the countable dense subset. Remember this is countable. Then we get that N has measure zero being a countable union of sets of measure zero. And we get that this, this convergence will hold all omega away from n and for all y in the dense subset. So we had these subsets, the, these measure zero sets where convergence fails for each individual y, but there were a priori different subsets. We combine them to a larger subset. It's larger, but it still has measure zero. And away from this subset, the convergence holds for every y instead of just an individual y. And that's the key thing here. And this set still has measure zero. That's where the separability is really used. So what does this tell us? Uh, this tells us since the closed unit ball of Y 
is dense. This is a theorem in the closed unit ball of its double dual. This is a theorem you probably haven't seen. It's in the appendix. It's called Goldstein's theorem. It's one of the results I assume you know. Of course, you probably don't know it. That's okay. I'm assuming you know it. Now you know it. Of course, this is using the identification of Y as a subset of the double dual of Y. This using this canonical embedding J, which I've used before. You get from this convergence up here, which holds for all Y in this dense subset of the unit ball of Y, you get the convergence of Fn paired against a functional Y double star. This is going to hold for all Y double star in the double dual of Y. You get this convergence here. If you think about that for a moment, what's really happening here? We've taken this convergence that we've proved by testing against a pre dual, and we've bootstrapped it up to testing against the dual of the space instead of the pre dual. <laughs> because the dual of X, X star, X is Y star. So X double star is Y. Hang on, X star is Y star star, right? So the dual of X is the double dual of the pre dual of X. <laughs> All right. What does this tell us? <laughs> this is all, you know, just proving things with no real motivation. Here is the punchline. These functions are all, oh, okay, Fn is measurable. So this function here, these functions here are all measurable. Pairing a measurable function against a functional gives you a measurable function. So this limit, countable limits of measurable functions are measurable. Countable limit, countable point-wise limit of measurable functions. What does that tell you? That tells you that F as a function from omega minus this null set into X is weakly measurable. That was our goal all along. Testing against every functional, you get a measurable function. That's weak measurability. And X is separable because we assumed X is separable. So Pettis, our friend Pettis implies that F is strongly measurable. Excellent, good. Because the way we defined F from the beginning up here, taking arbitrary weak star limit points, we had no guarantee that that was measurable in any way. We had no guarantee of uniqueness of the limit points even. So at least now we've found for an arbitrary choice of limit points, you get a strongly measurable function. Of course, it's gonna turn out we get a uniquely defined function, but we don't know that yet. At least this gives us something strongly measurable to work with. What did you not already show that it's unique? I mean, you wrote down an expression right after. Uh... This one here? Yes. Um, yeah, this, you're right. This is essentially showing that it's unique almost everywhere. Yeah, I mean, you've got a, an almost everywhere representation for every Y. And Y is count, the set of all Y in this is countable and then you use a density argument. And yeah, it, yeah, the uniqueness does come from that, that's true. But I didn't explicitly state it and we didn't explicitly use it. It's 11, but we'll finish this proof before we go to the break. We still need to show that Fn converges to F in the norm topology. We've got convergence in like the, in various topologies now, but not the norm topology. We need to show Fn converges to F almost everywhere. So away from N will do the job in X in the norm topology. So we do a sort of roundabout indirect argument. So for all omega not in N and for all arbitrary vectors in X, let's consider the difference, the distance from X to Fn omega. We're gonna substitute in F of omega for this X later on, but for now let's consider an arbitrary X. 
Now we can take a supremum over vectors y in this dense subset of the unit ball of y, the predual. And this is using the definition of, um, well, since x is the dual of y, x has the, the um, what's it called, operator norm, the, the norm that comes from being a dual space. This is the dual norm on x, oh, on y, sorry, on y dual. <laughs> x is the y dual, so we can use that dual norm, test against things in the predual. And what can we do with this? Well, this function here, x minus f and f is a martingale. Was that for martingale? Yeah, f is a martingale. That's kind of important. So this is actually a, what do I want to do here? Ah, sorry, I'm confusing myself. This pairing with y gives you a martingale. And that had a limit, which was f. <laughs> well, not f itself, but the pairing of f against y. So you can say this is the conditional expectation with respect to an of the function y paired against x minus f. Uh, I don't want to put the omega there. The x conditional expectation of this function evaluated at omega. <laughs> Maybe not immediately obvious, but it's true because this thing up here is a martingale. And it's got that limit f, which we use. Yep. And now what we do is we say, well, the conditional expectation of this pairing by properties of tensor extensions of operators is actually the pairing of y against the conditional expectation of the function x minus f. So I should put a tilde here, I guess, because this is the scalar valued the conditional expectation acting on scalar valued functions. And this is the conditional expectation acting on vector valued functions. And now I can put the omega here. Like yeah, this, this exists because this is positive, right? This operator. Yep. The conditional yeah, expectation right. was a positive operator. So it automatically had tensor extensions and we can freely talk about the conditional expectation on X valued functions. Okay. And to make sure that everything is nicely well defined, we use the fact, I don't think you really have to use this fact, but I'm using the fact here that this is strongly measurable, which we proved before. <laughs> so that's strongly, strong measurability that is helping us. I don't think you strictly need that to prove this, but it doesn't hurt, right? So now let's just take out the norm of Y and the norm of this guy here, this conditional expectation, acting on this vector valued function at omega in X, which is Y star. And D was a subset of the unit ball of Y just by construction. So this norm here is one, <laughs> so we can ignore it. And then we get something that's independent of the vector Y. <laughs> so we can remove that supremum, doesn't matter. And we use an estimate that we proved when we were showing that positive operators had vector valued extensions, we proved a pointwise estimate, which says that the norm of this is less than the scalar valued conditional expectation acting on the scalar valued function given by the pointwise norm at omega. We proved this in chapter one somewhere. So now we're nearly done. This function here is bounded and measurable. So what can we say? Let's take the limb soup as n goes to infinity of the left-hand side. This is less than or equal to the limb soup and goes to infinity of the right hand side. And because we're looking at a bounded measurable scalar valued function here and taking its conditional expectations as n goes to infinity, this is going to go to, the, um, I'm going to write something that's slightly wrong here and we're going to fix it. Should go to the value of that function 
itself. Is our, I should have the conditional expectation at A infinity here. So you don't know that our filtration is nice enough to actually generate the sigma algebra A that we're working on. This doesn't matter. This is fine. I have to fix that mistake in the notes. This doesn't affect the proof. Yeah, then I guess I should write this like that. Now the last step is to take X to be F of Omega. Zim super then goes to infinity of F of Omega minus F N of Omega. We want to show that this is zero because that would show that F N converges to F at Omega. F N of Omega converges to F of Omega, which is what we want to show. It's less than or equal to conditional expectation to a infinity of the function f omega minus f at omega. <laughs> this would be easier if that a infinity wasn't there. So let's pretend that that wasn't there. Let's pretend that the filtration was nice enough that we can ignore that. I'll fix the proof in the notes. Sorry, that's a bit of a mess. And then we get, we get a zero. <laughs> and that's what we wanted to show. Question here, do we need the conditional expectation onto infinity? Do we really need that for the proof to work? Can we fix this? We probably can. I've probably just made a small mistake somewhere. Mm, probably the f that? should be measurable in this, right? The f yeah. should be a infinity measurable, and then a infinity measurable. And then it probably just vanishes. Yeah, let's fix the proof right now on the spot because now I see how to do it. F is a countable limit of a n measurable functions up here. Well, not it. It's a a infinity measurable functions. Let's say. Because if you're a n measurable, then you're a infinity measurable. And so is weekly a infinity measurable. Pettis will tell you strongly a infinity measurable. Great. F is a infinity measurable. That will do it. So let's fix it up here. So yes, we do need the a infinity here. But this function in here is a infinity measurable. So let me write it out completely properly. So the conditional expectation vanishes and you get X minus F at Omega. And then you're good. That's how you do it. We've saved the proof. Very good. So just to summarize, I should say therefore FN or F bullet has an almost everywhere limit. And what were we even proving? Because it's easy to lose sight of that. X has the infinity Martin Gale convergence property. And what did we assume about X? It was a separable dual space. <sighs> All right, let's stop and breathe. <laughs> that was a, that's a nice proof that one. That you got to use a few things. We've gone 10 minutes overboard. I think now's a good time to have a break. <laughs> Any last questions? Well, I, I've tried to make sense of you uh, because you said you didn't have some uh, image of this L1 proof, right? That L1 does not have the uh, Martingale convergence property. Yeah. I've tried to visualize this, so I'm thinking of it this way. Um, so you start with a measure space that's just one point, yeah, and you have L1 on that point, so that's just uh, the scalar field, right? Yeah. And then you take this point and you have a process where you take this point and cut it in half, half the measure. Mm. Somehow with, depending on your probability space, you move the entire mass of your function on one of these halves, right? And then, and then you cut both of these points again into two. So now you get a square. And again, in this new dimension, depending on your probability space, you move the entire mass on one of the two halves. And you keep doing this. And the reason 
that this cannot converge is that each time you move basically the entire function on one half of the, the new split, right? So you, you always move the full mass of it, but it can never converge. Hmm. Uh, so I, I don't know whether that- I have to say that doesn't help me. <laughs> that doesn't help me. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to think about it. It could be that this is one of those examples where there are lots of different ways to think about it, and everybody's got their own way that works for them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Well, it, I, it's, I should have a, a better look at this example. I mean, it's 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 correlating with the fact that you can't do a little L one because on little L one you have these atoms. At some point, you run yeah. out of possibility splitting these atoms in half. Yeah. Maybe right. when we look at the Radonikodian property, it will make a bit more sense as well why this sort of splitting procedure doesn't lead to a nice Barnack space property. Uh, it actually does remind me of one of the Radonikodian proofs that we're going to do at some point. Yes. This whole splitting yeah. idea and looking arbitrarily small scale at the measure and how that can cause you problems. Yeah. Yeah. So I think in general, okay, I mean, for general L1 space, you don't start with a point, you just start with an entire space already, but then you yeah. look locally and, and you look sort of locally where the function is all nearly constant and there you cut into halves. As long as you don't have atoms, you can always find little regions where you shift uh, the whole mass yeah. on one half of it. And so you kind keep- Kind of self-similarity of L1 in a way, right? Yeah, like when you split, you like, get another right. copy of L1 sitting there. That's right. Yeah. And, and, but with little L1, you don't have that because yeah, you exactly. keep splitting that. So perhaps another way of looking at it is to say that uh, if you kind of fix one omega mm -hmm. and then you uh, let eta vary, then gn will just be uh, 2 to the n. If the first n entries in omega and eta coincide mm -hmm. and zero otherwise. Oh yeah, that's one uh, way to do it. Yeah, it's getting big. So, <laughs> it can't converge because it's getting too big. And yeah, if it, kind of morally, the limit is two to the power of infinity at omega yeah, so and zero sort of, everywhere else. Yeah, on your space, it's sort of looking. So it's like kind of a Dirac delta yeah. in some way. And it's converging something like this, right? On part of the space, it's getting really big, and it's an obstruction to convergence. But the L one norm is still uniformly bounded nicely, or something like that. I see the idea. I need to think about it a bit more, but that could be the right way to think of it. Well, that that uh, two to the n is one of the corners of my splitting, right? If you keep moving the whole mass on one half, there's going to be one corner in the end which it contains the whole mass, which is a uh, two to the n. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's as you said. It's it's uh, one example and many ways of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now's a very good time for a break. Now's the time we should be getting back to work. So we let's come back in 15 minutes.